what is three-dimensional space? Notationally, I like writing a funny looking R with a three. Is that three an exponent? Not really, though sort of. I'm not gonna go into the details about how it's sort of like an exponent. Technically speaking, it's not really an exponent in the usual sense of the word. I could think of this as a purely a set of ordered triples instead of ordered pairs. The set of all ordered triples, three numbers, X, Y, and Z inside parentheses, where X and Y, X, Y, and Z are all real numbers. Vertical line inside here means such that, or with the property that, I'll just say such that. X, Y, and Z are all real numbers. That's what R3 is as a set. Now you can talk about such a thing as just a pure set of ordered triples without trying to visualize it at all. And when we do try to visualize it, as we're about to, realize that that visualization is with respect to certain conventions. In particular, it's most often visualized in terms of a standard Cartesian coordinate system. You could call it rectangular coordinates, but these rectangular coordinates are three-dimensional because we've got three independent numbers here. We've got three axes. Trying to draw three axes on a two-dimensional piece of paper here, or on a two-dimensional board, blackboard, whiteboard, whatever, maybe on a screen, it's really hard. Some people are pretty artistic. They do a decent job at this kind of thing. Some people are not artistic at all, and they have a really hard time making drawings, at least. Some people who can't draw very well can still kind of visualize it in their heads, and some people who can't draw very well can't visualize it very well in your heads. No matter what boat you're in, it's something for you to work on, no matter what situation you're in. Am I very good at it? Um, I am okay relative to most people, I guess, but I'm not great at visualizing and drawing these things. Couple standard ways of drawing it. Actually, your book mentions two standard ways. One of its standard ways is actually one way I've never drawn it. I'm gonna draw out the two main ways that I draw it. Here's one way. With the X, the positive X axis, positive X axis coming out of the screen at you. Drawing it on this two dimensional piece of paper as if it's going to the Southwest on the paper. But you need to look at this and say, hey, that's coming toward me. You have to draw with perspective if you took an art class where you had to draw things with perspective. Positive Y direction to the right and a positive Z direction upward. Such a configuration does satisfy something called the right-hand rule. Sorry, left-handers. It's the right-hand rule. Can I put my hand in here to illustrate it? Uh, you want to curl, you have your hand open like this. Put your thumb, okay, curl, don't do the thumb right away. Curl your fingers from the X direction toward the Y direction, which I kind of have to do like this. and your thumb will point in the direction of the positive Z. That's according to the right-hand rule. What would be a left-hand rule? If I made this X the positive X direction and this the positive Y direction, then it would satisfy the left-hand rule. Question? That's how it is on my paper. Yep, so yes, I was doing my fingers toward you, pointing along almost in the direction of the X axis, curling them toward the Y axis. My thumb points in the direction of positive Z. And yes, my thumb does kind of curve a lot there. The way my thumb is. All right, that's one way of writing it, of drawing it. 
Another way that I commonly draw it is with the x-axis going to the right, positive x-axis, still following the right-hand rule, but now, yeah, now when I curl, my fingers start out more going horizontally here, curl toward the y-axis. I'm gonna want the y-axis going this way into the paper now, and the positive z-axis in the direction of my thumb, still pointing upward. Both of these three-dimensional coordinate system, systems satisfy the right-hand rule. Again, if you switched around the labels for the X and Y, then it would satisfy the left-hand rule. But wait a minute, shouldn't we allow X, Y, and Z to all go negative as well? Yes. So even with this picture, we need to imagine a negative X axis going into the paper, a negative Y axis going off this way, and a negative Z axis going down this way. And now I could label that with negative X, this with negative Y, and this with negative Z. I'm not gonna do that. Those are the negative directions. In this drawing, the negative X axis would go to your left and a little bit into the paper. The negative Y axis would come toward you and the negative Z axis still goes down. One good thing to keep track of in either of these pictures is the X, Y plane where Z is zero. The X, Y plane in this picture, well, in both pictures, it looks about the same. It's where Z is zero. And in this picture, the X, Y plane, yeah, it looks about the same. You could try to draw this with a little perspective, maybe about like that. Can you visualize this three-dimensionally in your mind? Some people have an easy time. Some people have a hard time. What are we ultimately interested in doing with these three-dimensional coordinate system, systems? The main things we're interested in doing are, for one thing, graphing functions of more than one variable. Well, I mean, before that point, we'll graph parametric curves in three dimensions instead of two dimensions parametric plot 3D will plot three-dimensional curves. What if I did cos T, sine T, which generates the unit circle on the plane, then add on a third coordinate, T, as T goes from zero to two pi, what does the finished curve look like? like that. I can rotate it around, click on it, rotate it around. In Mathematica, you don't see the axes, but you do see a, a box labeled with numbers. The convention is the positive x-axis goes to the right, positive y-axis goes into the screen, and positive z-axis goes upward. Mathematica's convention is like this one. If you want it to look like this one, you have to do a rotation, grab this and rotate it this way like that. Not perfect, but I can rotate it lots of ways. I can rotate it like this. So I'm looking sort of down the Z axis toward it and oh, trying to at least, doesn't always work so well. Trying to, and it looks like, oh, like a circle kind of, when you're looking down the z-axis toward it. That shouldn't be surprising. There we're ignoring the t. We also wanna make plots of higher dimensional functions like not with plot, but plot 3D. A function of two variables, x squared plus y squared, for example. We end up getting a surface in three-dimensional space, a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. And we will want to plot vectors as well. This is part of a big part of why this is called multivariable calculus. There's a distance formula for the distance d between any two points. 
whose coordinates are say x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, and z2. It is a generalization. D represents distance of the distance formula in the plane. Remember that formula? It involves a square root of a sum of squares. In three dimensions, does, does it involve a, a cube root of a sum of cubes? No. It still is a square root of a sum of squares. But now it's three squares instead of two. Take the difference of the x coordinates, square it, plus the difference of the y coordinates, squared, plus the difference of the z coordinates, squared. That's the distance formula in three dimensional space. Where does it come from? It comes from the Pythagorean theorem applied twice. Dare I try to draw how to apply it twice? I think I don't dare. Well, maybe except for a particular example. Let's do a particular example. So if, for example, I wanted to find the distance between the points with coordinates, so P, say, has coordinates, um, just going to make something up here, 2, negative 3, 2, and Q has coordinates, negative 1, negative 2, 4. Where will these points be in these two pictures? Focus on P first. Its X coordinate is positive 2 in this first picture. You've got to go two units along the positive X axis. Its Y coordinate is negative 3. Go three, coord three units along the negative Y axis. And its Z coordinate is 2. How can I combine these things to draw my point? It's difficult. It's helpful to draw like a box here, like I'm drawing. It's in the opposite corner. That's the point P. X is two, Y is negative three, Z is positive two. In this picture, X is two, Y is negative three, Z is positive two. It'd be more like in front of the picture here. When you draw such boxes, you should draw them lightly. Uh, P is right about there, which unfortunately looks like it's the origin, but it's it's in front of the origin. It's in front of the origin in this picture. Q, negative one, negative two, four. X is negative one, Y is negative two, Z is positive four. That's going to be behind the paper, so to speak. Um, Takes practice. Back here is going to be Q. And the line between P and Q is about like this. And it is kind of going upward. That's the line segment connecting them. In this picture, again, X is negative 1. Y is negative 2. Z is positive 4. Uh, Something about like this. It's going to be up there and the line connecting them will look about like that. So the distance between them is the length of that line segment. What is it equal? Two minus negative one is positive three. Negative three minus negative two is positive one or negative one, but that's being squared. Two minus four is negative two. So we get square root of nine plus one plus four, square root of 14, which is gonna be a little less than four. What's the distance? Okay, just plugging and chugging there. The harder part is visualizing it. 
More importantly, the distance formula helps you derive formulas for spheres, for example. What is a sphere? It's a general three-dimensional generalization of a circle. By the way, when I say circle in this class, I mean what's drawn in red here. I don't mean what's inside the circle. What's inside the circle is called a disk, officially in math. The circle itself is the boundary. Likewise, when I say a sphere, it's the boundary, not what's inside. If I meant what's inside, I'd call it a ball instead of sphere. I'm serious, these are official things that mathematicians do to distinguish between a circle and its inside and a sphere and its inside. What's the equation of a sphere? Well, the, a sphere is consists of all points in space that are equal distant from the center of the sphere, a distance of say r. So give me an arbitrary point whose coordinates are x, y, and z on the sphere. When I know the coordinates of the center, say x naught, y naught, z naught, the equation of the sphere of radius r could be written as square root of x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared plus z minus z naught squared equals r. More typical to square both sides to get rid of that square root. So your equation looks like this. And it generalizes the kind of thing you see with the equation of a circle in the plane. So that's the equation, the rectangular equation of a sphere of radius r centered at the point whose rectangular coordinates are x naught, y naught, and z naught. But if you're given a quadratic equation, how do you find the sphere itself? You have to complete the square. Take an example in number nine in the book. In section 10.1, x squared minus 8x plus y squared plus 2y plus z squared plus 8 equals 0. It's a quadratic equation. Does that necessarily mean its graph is a sphere? Not necessarily, actually. It might be something different. I will tell you what kinds of different things can happen in a few minutes here. But I think this one does end up representing a sphere. What sphere? What's the center and what's the radius? You have to complete the square for the x's and y's at least because they both have linear terms. You don't have to for the z because there's no linear term for the z. If there were a linear term for the z, you'd have to square complete the square in the z as well. Group the x terms together and the y terms together. The method of completing the square in both cases is to take the coefficient of the linear term, in this case, negative eight, divide it by two to get negative four, square negative four to get positive 16 and add it in there. Of course, you have to compensate by putting that on the other side too, if it's gonna be this, an equivalent equation. For the y terms, the coefficient of y is two, divide that by two to get one, one squared is one, Put a one in there. I'm gonna subtract eight from both sides, but I also have to compensate for what I did. I have to add 16 and add one to get an equivalent equation. But the benefit of completing the square is now what's in parentheses are perfect squares. This one is x, minus four quantity squared, and this one is y plus one quantity squared. And on the right, we get nine. How about that, a perfect square, three squared. Oops, I forgot my plus z squared, which I'll write as z minus zero squared. So we see then that this represents a circle of radius three centered at the point with rectangular coordinates four, negative one, zero. Circle 
of radius three centered at x, y, z equals four, negative one, zero. Dare we try to draw this sphere? I will try to draw a version of it. I'm not claiming it's gonna be a good version of it. I'm gonna make the x axis positive x axis come this way, positive y axis come this way, positive z axis come this way. Four, negative one, zero. My, the center of my sphere is in the x, y plane where z is zero. Pretend that's in that plane. Radius three. Ugh. So it does have to cross the x, y plane in a circle of radius three as well, centered at this point. Uh, trying to draw a circle with perspective here. I'm not gonna get this perfect. That would be the sort of like the equator of the sphere and then it would go up this way and down this way. Maybe you wanna do some shading to help you. Think of it as three-dimensional. There we have it, the Death Star. Although it's the eye of the Death Star is smaller than usual. It's in front of the paper, so to speak, in front of the screen, a little to the left of the x-axis where y is negative. And it's the center is on the xy plane, so half of it is above the xy plane and half is below. How can this, oh, why did I say circle? Sorry, sphere. How do you draw it in Mathematica? Not parametric plot 3D, not plot 3T, but instead contour plot 3D. Oh, all these different commands. Parametric plot is for parametric curves, functions of T. Plot 3D is for functions of X and Y. Contour plot is for general equations that are not necessarily functions of X and Y. And I'm gonna type it in there as the original equation looked, X squared minus eight X plus Y squared plus two Y plus C squared plus eight equals zero. When you're using contour plot to plot an equation, you need to use two equal signs. If you use a single equal sign, it messes things up because a single equal sign is an assignment of value. Here, we're just trying to plot an equation effectively do a bunch of solving to help you plot it. And that means in Mathematica, you need to use double equal signs. Uh, let's see. So the centered um, was at four, negative one, zero. I better go out to at least X equals seven to see the whole thing. I'll go negative 10 to 10 in all directions. But remember, Mathematica's default orientation is like that. So instead of seeing a picture like this, we're gonna see a picture where the sphere is more to the right than it is sort of like in front of the screen. If, oh, contour, contour plot 3D, sorry. Forgot my 3D. There we go. It's more to the right. Can I put some axes in here? Yeah, unfortunately, you have to do a little trick to do it. You have to plot the axes as uh, parametric curves. This is unfortunate. I'm gonna type axes equals parametric plot 3D. T00 is my first parametric curve. Zero T0 is my second and zero zero T is my third be going between negative 10 and 10. And let's make the axes a bit extra thick. I think I have to do it this way to make sure they're all thick and black. Now there are the axes, but I want to combine the pictures. That can be done with show. Show combines different graphs. 
axes is all I have to type because it's now stored in the variable called axes. And there we go, there are the axes. X-axis positive, X-axis is going to the right, positive Y-axis going into the screen, positive Z-axis going upward. I can rotate it like this to look more like the picture that I drew by hand. Now the positive X-axis is coming more towards you. Okay. Quadratic equations don't always produce spheres though. Uh, sometimes they produce things like that. Some sort of cone shape. Or if I change that zero to a one, a cone shape that's a bit wider in the middle. Or if I keep the one on the right and change another plus sign to another minus sign, a cone that doesn't meet in the middle. These different, well, the first one is a true cone. That's a true cone where it just meets at one point. These other two are not true cones. They're called hyperboloids. Three-dimensional version of a hyperbola. Hyperboloids. This is a hyperboloid of one sheet because it's only got one piece, so to speak. This is a hyperboloid of two sheets because it's got two pieces. So you don't always get spheres. And even if you had all plus signs, doesn't mean you're going to get a sphere. If I change one of these coefficients, like for x to say being four, then I get more like a, a football shape. Getting closer. Kind of. It's not a sphere. You can make it look more like a football. Uh, it's called an ellipsoid. Three-dimensional version of an ellipse. Hyperbolas become hyperboloids. Ellipses become ellipsoids. Parabolas become paraboloids. Okay. Fun, fun. You don't need to know all that at the moment. Just know about the sphere. We'll come back to that, those other things later.